the Lord is great, and his greatness is beyond measure. Uh, so glad that you're joining us for this online service from Wellington Square, our traditional service. I want to turn our attention to Psalm 93, a psalm that defines the Lord's greatness. He's bigger than any of the seas that crash upon the shores of our life. Let's listen. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. He is robed in majesty and is armed with strength. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. Your throne was established long ago. You are from all eternity. The seas have lifted up, O Lord. The seas have lifted up their voice. The seas have lifted up their pounding waves, mightier than the thunders the great waters, mightier than the breakers of the sea, the Lord on high is mighty. Your statues stand firm. Holiness adorns your house for endless days are the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, help us to remember how great you are, that you are mighty, that you are from before time, that you care for your people, for those in whom the seas of this world roar and rush and beat against, and yet you reign. You care for us. You number the hairs on our head, and you hear our cry, and you count our tears. Lord, you are good and worthy of our worship. Open the eyes of our hearts to see you and our minds to encounter you. May you embrace your people gathered here at this place, reaching out by faith to you. Draw us near. Give us calm. Speak your word. 
Father, I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Reading from 1 Thessalonians, starting at uh, verse 12 in chapter 5. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to respect those who work hard among you, who are over you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. Live peaceably with each other. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, to warn those who are idle, encourage the timid, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Make sure nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always try to be kind to each other and to everyone else. Be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus.
Let's pray. Lord, indeed, be our vision, ruler of all. And in these times, we need your grace to see and your help to hear and your hand to comfort. And so I pray that you would be with me and with us as we listen for your word. May your spirit bring it to life in and through all of us who are listening and seeking you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're in a series on Thanksgiving and trying to find thankful hearts in the midst of troubling times. And uh, we feel like we're in the midst of a never-ending pandemic. Last week, we looked at Psalm 50, and, and God begins to reveal his heart to his people. He gathers the people of Jerusalem, of Israel, his covenant people, and he begins to let them know how they're doing. And then he lets them know what, what really he wants from them. And he declares that he wants a sacrifice of thanksgiving. And then we found out later that a sacrifice of thanksgiving is defined in Leviticus as a time when someone is very thankful for what God had done in their life and that they would get some bread, uh, both leavened and unleavened bread, and they would pour piles and piles and piles of olive oil on it, and they would bring it to the temple as a sign, a concrete sign of their hearts being thankful to God. And I spoke about how when we will turn our hearts to thanking God, when we know all that God has given us, all those gifts of creation and of, of what Christ has done for us and the promise of what he's going to do for us, when we remember that in our hearts, that our souls are strang strangely fed. That there's a bread of his, his strengthening of our souls. And then there's the presence of his Holy Spirit saturating us, strengthening us, allowing for his fruit, the fruit of the Spirit, to be growing in us. And, you know, after I finished that sermon last week, I, I had a sense of God saying it wasn't complete. <laughs> what I preached, I was missing something. And, and so I was, I was um, troubled by that. And, 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 you, and the sense that people are in such dark and difficult places that as much as they want to be thankful, in and of their st own strength, they can't. That hearts are so heavy and and burdens so difficult and the future so uncertain that as much as people want to be able to give God the thanksgiving of sacrifice, they can't. And so before I had even heard this from God, we had chosen a passage. And in it is, is Paul beginning to outline more requests from God to his people. And he's, and he's requesting that his people, these Thessalonians, that they would do something in their honor of God. He kind of defines it at the end of uh, chapter 5. Near the end of his letter, he, he, he lets them know the kind of inner attitude that God longs to have when he says, always be joyful, keep on praying, um, and be thankful, thankful in all circumstances, for that's the will of those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, Paul knows that these Thessalonian Christians are suffering they too, like us, are in a very difficult time. He writes this, You suffered from your fellow citizens the same things those churches suffered from the Jews who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and also drove us out. So he's saying that they are under extreme attack. And yet Paul is beginning to throw to them too an impossible challenge to always be joyful, to be constant in prayer, and thankful in all circumstances. Now, I don't know about you, but when someone says for me to do something always, I, I find that very hard. And when they define it as always being joyful, or when they're saying you need to always be praying continually or giving thanks in all circumstances, I find the weight and burden of these commands overwhelming. And I thought, well, maybe these commands are just for this particular people at this particular time. But if you look closely at the context, you find out that this is not just a command that Paul has been given by the Lord for us, for, for that particular people. But he says that this command is for all who are in Christ Jesus. This is for everyone who would say yes to Jesus 
offer to forgive their sins and adopt them into his kingdom. And so these commands, these heavy commands, to always be joyful, to pray constantly, to be thankful in all circumstances, that's a command for me and for you. And then I started to ask myself, how well am I doing in honoring this command of the Lord? Like, like can it be said of me that I'm always joyful? I mean, that's a big word. That's a big call. I mean, to always be joyful means that when your life take a, takes a nosedive, are you joyful in that moment? I mean, when you bring your car to the mechanic to get an oil change and he gives you a call that you need a $1,000 brake job, are you joyful in that moment? I mean, sure, I can be joyful from time to time, from moment to moment. But the call of the scripture is that I would always be joyful. I think that's a very unrealistic expectation. So I'd have to say that I am a sinner. I am missing the mark of always being joyful. <laughs> Next, am I always consistent and constant in my prayer? I mean, haven't you found it hard during this COVID-19? I'm, I'm consistent and constant in my checking of my phone to make sure of what the latest numbers are in Ontario of the COVID numbers or the latest protocols. But I find myself slipping away from being constant in prayer with Jesus. That the noise outside and the noise inside makes it very hard for me to get still in the presence of Jesus and to begin to come to the throne of grace and to wrestle for the grace that I need and that we need. So I'm not constant in prayer. <laughs> How about you? And the last command is that Paul asks uh, us who are in Christ Jesus that we would be thankful in all circumstances. I want to I point off right off from the beginning. He doesn't say to be thankful for all circumstances. No, I, I don't think we can be thankful for betrayal or for sickness or for a thousand and one tr troubles that affect us and others. No, I don't think we're called to be thankful for those things. We're called to be thankful in and amidst them. And I find it's very hard for me to be thankful when all around me seems like a, a weight of heaviness. It's hard to focus and to be thankful in an age where uncertainty is all around us. Now, if I were hooked to a lie detector right now and someone asked me if I'm thankful in all circumstances, I'd have to answer no, not even close. When things get bad and when things get troubling, I can easily grumble or complain. But thankfulness, that's not my default setting, no. When things go sideways, I find it very hard to be thankful in that circumstance. So Paul's three requests, Paul's three commands from the Lord to all those who are in Christ Jesus, what kind of pastor am I that I'd have to check no, 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 to each one of them. I wonder if it's three strikes and you're out. But I know more about Paul, and I've read a lot about what he said. And, and so I know that Paul ha has a, a context in which he's writing. And, and, and as I long to say, yes, Paul, I long to be always joyful, and I long to be constant in prayer, and I long to be uh, one who's thankful in all circumstances, I long for that to be true of me. I am far from living that out. I noticed some hope that Paul writes about those that find themselves when we want to give the sacrifice of thanksgiving to God, and we find it really hard. When we want to be joyful in all circumstances, and we, we find it hard. When we find the hard call of Jesus to, to live in the way in which he calls us to, Paul begins to say that he understands the contradictions that live inside us, that live in sincere Christ followers. That we know what we're called to do, and yet we fall far short. So Paul begins to define his heart. He says, so I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, although he wants to be joyful in all things and constant in prayer and thankful in every circumstances, I'm adding that, he says, evil is right there within me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. 
But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner to the law of sin at work within me. And then Paul makes an assessment of himself. He is a follower of Jesus. He, he walked and he knew Jesus. He was called to be an apostle in a very high position. He's writing Romans when he's got it all figured out. And when he takes an assessment of himself according to the one in whom he's called to be, the standard in which he's called to live out, this is his personal assessment. He says, what a wretched man am I. Who will rescue me from this body of death? And I'm thankful he answers. He says, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. You see, when you and when I fall far short of the mark in which Christ calls us to live out, to, to live out of, of that place of always being joyful and, and being constant in prayer and thankful in all situations, when we miss the mark, we're called not to deny it or minimize it or rationalize it. We're called not to memorize more Bible verses or to give more time or, uh, or, or be about more good things to try and earn our way back into God's favor. No, it's just a time to be like Paul and to cry out, Jesus, please deliver me. See, this is the cry that, that brings Jesus to attention. This is the cry that brings heaven to help. This is the cry that establishes a miracle in our midst. This is music to Jesus' ear. It's a delight to his heart when you and I who are in him cry out for his help. That, that we cannot do what only he can do. Only he can change our inner attitudes. And when we are aware of the places where we're missing his high calling, it's, it's a time where we can call out for his grace to be the people he calls us to be. And the whole work of the Holy Spirit is to point out those areas so that we too can, on bended knee, cry out to Jesus, oh, please change me. Make me like you. And this is the hard work of a follower of Jesus to be constantly, honestly assessing ourselves, not according to one another, but in the light of who Christ is and who he calls us to be. And if we're honest, again and again, we say, what a wretched person we are. And then we find out again and again in all of the Gospels that those who are honest about their need for healing and for forgiveness for, for the blind who cried out for Jesus for help, or, or the lepers who, who would not let go of him, or the woman who's so ashamed of the life that she lives, all she can do is speak a volume through tears on his feet. To all of these ones who come to Jesus for his healing touch, never once does he say no. You see, that's who Jesus Christ is. He is one who reaches out to those who cry out, deliver me, help me, heal me, change me, make me like you. That humble place of asking for his help brings a response. Jesus will transform us. Jesus will have mercy on us. And you see, that's the whole good news of Jesus Christ and his gospel that he is the savior to any and to all who will call on his name for help. And so when we hear his high calling to be holy like him, to be perfect like him, and we cry out, oh Lord, I long to be like that. Please, would you transform me from the inside out? Would you work on this in the very fabric of my being? So I no longer live, but it's you who lives in and through me. In the Old Testament, we find a man named Abraham, who was given this great promise of God, who, who promised that he would have a child, and from this child will come a great nation. And Abraham is a, an old man. And, and he begins to wonder, can God actually do this promise? I mean, he's promised this to me. And, and Sarah begins to talk to him, and, and they figured out that they're too old to have kids. And so Sarah says, why don't you have one with my handmaiden? And so that's what 
Abraham does. And so Hagar is born, and, and they know from the get-go this was not God's plan. And, and God meets up with Abraham, and he begins to put his hand around uh, uh, Abraham, around his shoulder, and he says this. This one is not the heir I'm talking about, Hagar. <laughs> but the heir that's going to come is, is one from your own body, and, and he will be your heir. And then the Lord took him outside and he, he showed him all the stars. And he says, now look to the heavens and count the stars, if you're able. And somehow in that moment where, where God was showing Abraham what he was going to do in his life, this, this seemingly impossible thing, something that Abraham could not do in his own strength, he believed God. And it was credited to him as righteousness. <laughs> you see, the gospel is Jesus makes this incredible promise to us. He says, I'm going to make you like me, holy and righteous, joyful in all circumstances, constant in connecting with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thankful in everything. I'm going to make you like me. He puts his arm around our shoulder and he shows us this new creation in whom we're becoming. And then he calls us to believe in him, that he will complete the work he started. And that's the challenge for us in Christ, is there's moments when we, we can remember saying yes to Jesus and, and encountering his wonderful Holy Spirit working in us. And then there's moments where we become like Abraham when we start to work on our own strength, figuring out our own way to make it happen only to find ourselves disappointed by the heavy burden. It's only when we rest our faith on Jesus Christ and him alone to transform us. That's when we find we're made right. That God has to make us right. It's his heavy burden in Christ. And so when we find ourselves convicted under the weight of our sin, like Paul was, and he can say, who can deliver me from this? It's not Paul. It's Jesus Christ. And so when we hear these calls to be thankful in all things, and who can deliver me from an unthankful heart? It's only Jesus Christ. Paul would write to the Galatians. And these Galatians would for a season just believe in the righteousness of Jesus Christ and what he secured for them. And then all of a sudden they started to drift. And they started to try and work their salvation. And all of a sudden, they found that they lost the strength and the power to make progress. And uh, all of a sudden, Paul begins to say, You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like you to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law or believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning with the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by human effort? Have you experienced so much in vain, if it was really in vain? Does God give you his Spirit and work miracles among you by observing the law or by believing what you heard? And so also, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. You see, for us to be joyful always and to be constant in prayer and thankful in all circumstances, we need Jesus to do a miracle in us, miracle after miracle after miracle. Jesus needs to rewrite the very DNA of our heart and our minds. I believe that as I pondered after the last sermon, um, Jesus was speaking to my heart. And, um, and, and he was saying that um, all that I said was right and good and from Scripture. But for my people to bring me a sacrifice of thanksgiving, I need to wash and cleanse them. I need to open their eyes to all that I'm doing. I need to reassure them of the, my love for them and my presence with them. 
I need to take off the heavy burden of guilt and shame and replace it with my wedding garments of honor and unconditional love. And then I heard this gentle, if they but ask, I am willing to do all this and so much more. And so I want to ask for you and for me that Jesus would do a wonderful miracle in this prayer in our lives. Let's pray. Jesus, wash us and cleanse us from any and all sin. Jesus, open our eyes to see you. Take whatever cataracts we have off our eyes and allow us to see all that you're doing in our midst to reassure us of your love for us and your presence with us. Please take off the heavy burden of guilt and shame and place upon each one of us your wedding garment of honor and unconditional love. Jesus, please so work in us that we might more and more experience the miracle of a transformation inside, becoming more and more like you, more and more joyful, more and more constant in prayer, more and more thankful in all circumstances. And most importantly, Jesus, becoming more and more like you. May we die and may you live in each one of us. Lord, I pray in your name. Help us to believe your great calling for each one of our lives. Amen.
Let us pray. God of our hearts and our hopes, as the season continues to change and harvests are gathered, we thank you for the beauty around us, the brilliant colors, birds flying south, the crackle of fallen leaves, and the rhythms of this time of year. We are grateful for your steadfast love and so much that changes. This autumn, we also face unpredictable changes as the pandemic continues. Draw close to those who find the uncertainty unsettling and help us preserve our connection to you and to each other. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of our imaginations and insights, we thank you for all the ways you inspire human minds to create things which improve the lives of your people. We are grateful for all the medical efforts taken to manage COVID-19 and for the scientists testing vaccines. Give them perseverance and success. Guide politicians and policymakers so that breakthroughs and resources are shared with the most vulnerable. Especially be with our mayor, Marianne Mead Ward, our Premier Doug Ford and Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and all our elected officials. Grant them all the wisdom and grace they need to govern with compassion and justice for all. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of neighbors and neighborhoods, we praise you for everyone working to build and maintain healthy communities. For teachers and librarians, healthcare workers, coaches, construction workers, farmers and laborers, store clerks and wait staff. So many have had their workplaces changed and their livelihoods threatened by the pandemic. Give them perseverance and encouragement. Make us good neighbors to all who serve our community and remind us to say thank you. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of comfort and compassion, we pray for all those who are struggling this autumn, whatever the reason. We remember before you those facing illness or waiting for treatment, those who have lost income and worry about winter expenses and shelter, those who are grieving the loss of someone close, and those whose mental health is under pressure these days. Awaken your people around the world to attend to the needs of those at risk in our communities so that they will know your comfort and compassion. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now, with gratitude for your love poured into the world through Christ Jesus, we pray as he taught us. Please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever, amen.
may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, may he equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. God bless you this week. Amen.